when you ask questions, um, only your voices will be recorded. So um, it will stay sort of pinned to me. But if you don't even want your voice to be recorded, you can write it in the chat box instead. OK, Anupama, first time. Welcome to you. <laughs> so we started two weeks ago and we managed to get through two pages, which is pretty good. In some people's book, that's pretty good. As I said, Vanta Sajato, you can go for one word for four classes, five classes. No, I think one word is one class, but I heard there was a sutta that he did that took 14 classes. So we're doing quite well. It's all relative. So we started with right view comes first. This is the chapter on right understanding, otherwise known as right view. And uh, someone was asking last week and the week before, what does it mean this right view? Why the word right? And the main point of that is that it's right in the sense that it leads in a certain direction. It leads to the goal that the Buddha is teaching, right? So it lead, it's right in the sense that it will lead to the liberation, the awakening experience of a Buddha. So to the complete destruction of greed, hatred and delusion, to the cessation of all suffering, so in that sense, this is the right view. And of course, there are mundane benefits all along the way, because that person was saying, I don't know if she's here today, um, is it right in the sense that it leads to harmony? And harmony, of course, is the overall topic of this book. And so all the Buddha's teachings should definitely lead to harmony within ourselves, within our communities, and ultimately harmony within our mind. So we covered right view comes first, which was talking about preliminary and um, the right view of the noble ones. And then we talked about understanding the unwholesome and the wholesome as an aspect of right view. And that was part of the Majjhima Nikaya number nine, in which there are many, many um, different definitions of right view. I did jot a few down, which I don't think I mentioned last week. Would it be interesting to just go through the other things that he talks about as uh, aspects of right view in the Samaditi Sutta. So as I said, in this Samaditi Sutta, uh, Majjhima Nikaya number nine, um, everything is framed in the same sort of formula as the Four Noble Truths are framed. So this is classically speaking, the sort of doctor, um, the doctor's diagnosis kind of formula. So first of all, there's a disease. Then he talks about the cause of that disease the fact that there can be an end and then the way, the prescription, if you like, to the end of that disease. So in the same way, all of these are described that way. The, the thing itself, the cause of that thing, the fact that there is a cessation, that thing can cease, and then the way to the cessation. So I don't have that sutra in front of me. What is the root of the unwholesome? So yeah, so I just have the main subject. So it follows the same formula. So here he's saying, and what friends is the unwholesome and what is the root of the unwholesome? What is the wholesome and what is the root of the wholesome? And then the next one is nutriment. So he's analyzing nutriment in terms of what is its cause? What is the way to cessation? What is the cessation and the way to cessation? So the causes for nutriment are food. Is this right? Yeah, nutriment is basically food, contact, mental volition and consciousness. So food keeps the body going, right? Contact, in a sense, keeps the feeling going because it's through contact that Vedana arises. And then mental volition is like the sankharas or the will, if you like, from which consciousness, the next mind moment will arise. And then volition. Oh, no, sorry, that's mental volition. And then the next one is consciousness. Yeah, so from, from volition, the consciousness, knowing, in other words, arises. And then other things to understand as part of our view are the Four Noble Truths. Again, their origin, their cessation and the way to cessation. Aging and death, their origin, cessation and way to cessation. Birth, same thing. Being, and that means any kind of being, whether it's in the sense sphere, 
um, that we live in, so the world of the five and six senses, really, um, or the fine material realms, which are basically realms that can be equated to jhana realms. So it's very fine material. There's no kind of sense of a solid body such that we have in this realm. And then the, uh, there are the immaterial realms, the arupa lokas. And then clinging has to be understood in terms of its origin, cessation, and the way to cessation. And then craving, which is just in a sense, a sort of um, more consolidated form of clinging, but the two usually arise together. And then feeling can be understood in these ways and contact. And then I've run out of place on my little thingy, but there were actually a few more so it's basically any phenomena of body or mind that we can experience, if it can be understood in terms of its origin, its cessation and the way to cessation, then it is an aspect of right view. And you could also look at it the other way around, that if we have right view, we'll be able to see the origin and the cessation and the way to cessation of all these phenomena. So it's almost like once you break through to that right view, the causes for any kind of becoming, uh, being undermined, so once there is stream entry, then you only have, you know, at, at most seven more lives. There just isn't enough kind of fuel of becoming to last any longer, if you like. So that was just going very quickly through um, that Majjhima Nikaya number nine. Otherwise we won't get on to the next little passage. But um, I did want to suggest in this class in general that because all of these um, readings that we do are excerpts from a, a sutta, then your homework, <laughs> I could give you some homework, which would be to go and read the whole sutta, if you wish. And um, since you know where we're at in the book, and if you have the book at home, you could even do that before you come to the class. And then that might give you also um, maybe more questions or contributions, or just a better kind of context and understanding of what we're reading. So, I mean, the reason I chose this is because it's, it's good to start somewhere in the suttas and hopefully because it's small kind of sections and they're grouped in themes, it can give us a general outline of the Buddha's teachings in some depth. But of course, they are just excerpts, so you can read around them, but it's a starting point. So the next uh, passage that we have here is called A Miscellany on Kamma. And this is from the Anguttara Nikayas, number six. So I shall read through this. Um, and I may make comments, but I will also pause at certain points and ask if you have any questions, interjections, um, anything you'd like to share. So I will change the word monk for community today. The Buddha is addressing the community. <clears throat> when it was said, kama should be understood, the source and origin of kama should be understood, the diversity of kama should be understood, the result of kama should be understood, and the cessation of kama should be understood, and the way leading to cessation of kama should be understood. For what reason was this said? So this is very similar, isn't it, to the same formulation, but there's a little bit added here, like the diversity of karma, the result of karma. So we're going into a little bit more detail, but the point is always that we understand it's arising and we understand how it ceases. This is really, you know, the essence of the path, suffering and its end. So then the Buddha begins, it is volition, everyone that I call Kamma. Chaitana Aham Kamma Vadami. And this is just such a beautiful phrase. It's something you could write down, put it on your wall, because it really is kind of everything. If it's volition that is Kamma, that produces the karmic effect of happiness or unhappiness, suffering or, or joy, then we know where to start working. We start to work on where we're coming from. Hmm? rather than what we're going to get in our life, 
how things are going to turn out, even sometimes whether the relationships work out or not. We can't always control it. We can only really take care of where we're coming from and try to refine that more and more. So it is volition that I call karma. For having willed, one acts by body, speech or mind. So it's the quality of that volition that determines how we act and whether those actions of body, speech or mind will produce positive or wholesome, helpful, um, ennobling results or not. <clears throat> and what is the source and origin of karma? Contact is its source and origin. So this is a strange sentence and I was a bit confused by that because you don't see that in most of the suttas. Usually the deeper cause of karma, the deepest cause really is um, delusion, right? Because of delusion, sankara arises, which is really another word for karma. Um, so I asked Ajahn Brahma about this and he actually said, he also found that quite strange and probably Ajahn Brahmali would know exactly where that occurs in the suttas and how many times, but I, I don't have that kind of, <laughs> not only not that kind of mind, but not those computer skills to go in and like put it in and find out how many times it arises. But basically we figured what it really means here is that unless there's some kind of contact to any one of the six sense doors, so the eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth, um, the tongue, and the mind and physical touch, unless there's actually a contact between those sense doors and their respective objects, um, we, we don't feel anything, right? Because there has to be contact in order for consciousness, sense consciousness to arise and that arises with feeling. It always arises together with feeling. And so unless there is that contact, we can't really have volition, we can't really act, we're simply unaware, right? Imagine if there's no contact at any of those sense doors, basically you're unconscious, right? So you can't react, you can't have volition, you can't produce results, karma, action of body, speech and mind. So I think it's talking about the uh, immediate cause here, because even causality has many levels. You can have immediate cause, predisposing cause. Um, there's one kind of cause that's like, I suppose it's this one, like the one that's right before it, that's right before um, whatever happens, I forget the word for that. But in Ayurveda, in Indian medicine, which I studied, there were about 20 or 30 different types of causes. And it was really fascinating to look at all that. So any questions so far on that or any comments? Yes, I see someone with their real finger up. Can you see that, Gunther? Yeah, um, I'm asking to unmute Maxwell. Thank you. Yes. So there should be a button there moment. that you can press. Okay, yes, I've got it somewhere. Hi, great. I'm just wondering with, with contact, is it really, con we should all have as well, contact with our fellow beings, what, yeah. whatever, whatever they are? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, good contact. That's a really good point, actually. And mm. um, yeah, really good point. Just, mm -hmm. Yes, especially when we're thinking about acts of body, speech, and mind. We're, especially when we're thinking about acts of body and speech, right? Um, but the thing is we can still make karma with the mind, even with the absence of contact with other beings. But I think most of the karma that we make is usually through body and speech because it tends to be the case that things start in the mind and as they become stronger, then they tend to kind of spill over, if you like, into the speech. You know, it's like you might have some anger or some irritation arising. And if you can catch it at that stage, at that sort of level and um, learn how to relate to it in a wiser way and have a bit of restraint around your speech, then it's unlikely to come out in speech. It's probably more likely to start to dissipate. But if, 
it comes out in speech, it's when it's stronger. So it kind of grows and becomes speech and then it grows even stronger and becomes physical action. You know, you hit a person, hopefully no one does that. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Contact, we can contact with the mind as well. Mm. Mm. So yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, no. Do you want to do you want to elaborate on that? The contact with the mind. Hmm. It, it's just when you have contact with someone, some people, then there's no need for speech. Mm. For a sense, you just feel the contact you have with their their mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if that contact is good contact. Then there's good karma that between the two of you, three yeah. of you, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's a really beautiful yeah. reflection. Mm. Yes, and in a sense, if there is that beautiful, wholesome connection, and you can, you know, mm. feel inspired or just feel at mm. peace and at ease in each other's company, it's mm. actually, yeah you don't need to have that physical or verbal mm. communication. Mm. And then you're much less likely to actually cause each other any harm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's always um, interesting on retreats when you're sort of sitting in silence with people for 10 days. And of course you can still have your own little preconceptions about what people mm. are like and that kind of thing. But on the whole, there's a real sense of camaraderie and that everyone's sitting together and tuning up to each other and going through things together. It's almost a disappointment at the end <laughs> when you have to break into speech. And um, mm. It, it sometimes seems so kind of unnecessary to actually start with sort of, oh, hi, what's your name, you know? Because you've gone so much further than that already on your journey together. Mm -hmm. um, and actually it can be really lovely. Like sometimes you connect with people already as though you know them, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's only after you've spoken to them for a couple of hours, you realize you don't actually know their name. <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. I like that, I hadn't thought of it. I was thinking more about the mind as when you're with yourself. Mm. But some of my most powerful experiences in my monastic life and spiritual life have been being in silence with others, mm. especially with a teacher, you know, mm. in meditation. And sometimes there's a transmission, almost like a transmission that goes across, like an energetic. I'm not sure if it's always, it's not usually intentional, I think, but sometimes it is. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Beautiful. It's really enriching to hear people's thoughts on these things because I get bored inside my own head. <laughs> Anything else anyone would like to add at this point? Oh, one moment. Thank if you could use your little raise hand symbol, that's the best, because if you do it on the vid, we don't, if you use the raise hand symbol, it comes up in a list of people. Because uh, I could see someone with their real well, hand. Should be able to talk. Okay. Rob, are you there? What about now? Yeah, yeah, no. Good. Good. Yeah. Um, just a question about karma. I've always thought it was um, meaning action. Mm. I've always just thought it was like physical action or speech. Ah. But does it cover um, mind activity as well, do you think? Yes. Oh, absolutely. It's actually more where that body and speech, that, sorry, that action of body and speech is coming from that ah. creates karma because it's likely to lead into body and speech. I mean, from what it says here, I'll, I'll read that sentence out again. Because the Buddha actually calls volition karma, and that means the volition that happens at the mental level. But then he said, because once that volition has happened at the mental level, one acts by body, speech, or mind. Yeah. So it's more like where you're coming from Yes, than I, what you actually say or do or th even think. It's more like what is fueling that. And we'll have a look at that in a bit more detail 
But generally speaking, I mean, again, it's kind of the quality of that come will depend on your motivation. And motivation is usually like divided into positive and negative motivations. So the three right motivations or intentions are always like meta, uh, non-harm, uh, letting go or giving away, giving up, non-ownership, renunciation. And That's then the- Almost like the second part, the second factor then. Sorry? The number. So karma is almost like the second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path then, in some respects. Um, yeah, I think it's very close to it. I think it's very close to it. Okay. But you're, yeah, I mean, if you focus on the second factor, like in meditation, I mean, Ajahn Brahm actually calls that making good meditation karma. Because it's what you do with what arises in your mind that will determine whether or not that leads to happiness or suffering for you. It's not even the content of your experience that's that important. It's more how you relate to it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's actually quite simple, I think. I mean, it can start to get quite complicated when we talk about it. And of course, to understand it at its depth, you need to be like a stream winner. <laughs> But at least to get the idea that if we start taking care of like our motivation, the motivation be behind our thoughts and our um, actions and speech, then we're on the right track. I mean, my first teacher, Goenkaji, he gives quite a kind of a very obvious example. But he says, you know, two people have a knife and both people kill a person with that knife. But one person is like a robber who goes into somebody's house and, you know, wants to steal and gets kind of caught and then they use that knife to kill the, to kill the person. So, but the other person has a knife and, but they're a surgeon and they're performing a life-saving operation. And whether that person dies, I think in that example, that person dies as well. So it's not the fact that they've killed that determines the karma, it's actually what was motivating that. And of course, in the physician's case, there was a motivation to save life. It just so happens that that person died. So he, the, the karmic effect, if you like, will not be the same. In fact, it will be the complete opposite. So we just start to care more about our intentions than the results. Although, of course, that's a whole other area, learning to speak skillfully, and not just to say, well, I was saying it with meta and I'm sorry it hurt you. You know, you can actually also refine the way you speak and learn a bit more about, you know, what's appropriate or what's uh, inclusive, for example. So I think, yeah, one more question was there. I think Dini was first. So um, I'm not sure if she still wants. I think, can we have Diana? Because I think her hand was up. Good. I'm not sure. Oh, Dini was also there. Okay, we'll have you both. Oh, Dini, sorry. That's okay. Go for it, Diana. We'll have both of you. Okay. Diana first, yeah. I'm sorry. I'll lower my hand. Um, <sighs> maybe contact is the cause of karma because mm -hmm. from contact comes sensation and from sensation comes desire yeah. or craving. So that's where the volition yes, is yeah. initiated. I agree, yes. And yeah, yeah, that's a really important point that, you know, from that contact, Vedana arises and Vedana sensation or feeling is then the condition for craving to arise, tanha to arise. But the thing is that still it isn't the deepest cause because by the time that Vedana arises, that contact is there, Vedana arises, the whole process is already conditioned by delusion. <laughs> and this is what it took me years to understand because I was practicing with um, the Vipassana technique that was focused on sort of so-called cutting the chain of dependent origination at that link between Vedana and Tanha. And it, it took a long time to realize that that wasn't sufficient. And you, the Buddha never really talked about cutting it completely at that point. Because the thing is, as long as delusion is still conditioning the process up to that point, you might think you're not reacting, <laughs> you know, or you might think that there's no desire, but there's very subtle hindrances involved. You're not seeing things clearly enough to be sure. 
So that's why when we start going into deeper meditation with Samadhi, we're looking at um, starving delusion from its nutriment because these five hindrances are, are known as what nourish delusion. So you can't just eradicate delusion, it's already here, that's why we're here, but you can starve it of its nutriment by overcoming those five hindrances. And once those five hindrances are overcome, then what we see is much, much clearer. And then at that level of Vedana, I think we'll be much more aware about whether we're really reacting with craving or not. Even subtle things, you know, like in your meditation, you think that there's no restlessness or craving or desire. I mean, I had years when I, I didn't really see a hindrance, you know, but there was something there, otherwise I'd have been flying in the jhanas. You know, there was a little bit of restlessness or something was there. Even the fact that I was moving through the body was kind of like, yeah, there was still movement, right? Okay. From a subtle sort of wanting, I suppose. Mm. Anyway. Does that make sense? That was quite, yeah, quite um, right. involved. Do you oh yes, yes. Ah, <laughs> um, thank you. Um, hi. My question. Hi, Aya. Um, you already answered my question somewhat, and my question is: What if we, our volition is one thing and our act is another? Yeah. And my question <laughs> is. Um, my cats had like some time ago and they had we had the flea infestation and the thing is mm. i really really didn't want to kill the fleas sure but if i didn't kill them they would just you know get more yeah. and more and more and they ultimately would end up getting killed as well and ever since i feel in such a dilemma like emotionally like yeah <laughs> having done something which I know was kind of like the reasonable thing to do. But at the same time, obviously, I kill and I go against the first precept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. What about that? It's, a, it's a very common question. And maybe I can reassure you by sharing something that happened to me as well. <laughs> Basically, I mean, in terms of volition and karma, it's very hard to have completely white and black karma. Usually it's like there's various shades in between. So it, it's almost impossible to have 100% pure volition unless you're completely free from the hindrances of the mind. So I think most of the time we're just working with best case scenario and trying to weigh it more heavily on the side of the good. So with ethical issues like that, it is complicated. And as you say, you know, you can't just let the fleas continue yeah. to reproduce <laughs> um you can't do that because eventually i don't know what will happen i don't know but it won't be very good so i think some of it is just what we have to accept from being alive as human beings that it's not possible not to create some amount of negative comma but we yeah. can actually dilute that comma by the amount of good that we do and if i can get to the end of this little thing i also want to read out a sutta that talks about that because that's really quite encouraging otherwise okay. there'd never be an end to the comer <clears throat> if yeah. we had to you know experience every single result of every single deed we'd yes be this, we'd be in this forever yeah. forever and ever and you know we have been already and we don't want that to carry on yes. so so yeah but my story is that um i'm in a house in oxford and i've been having guests but then of course with covid i haven't been able to have any guests for like a whole year now and we have had a carpet moth infestation and it's been really quite bad. Um, and so I wasn't quite sure what to do because I thought really the landlord should deal with it. But if I ask him to do it, I mean, I'm asking him to kill them. So it's like, and then I'm yeah. also risking myself by having him come and it's not legal to have him come because it's COVID. And it, so I had to speak to my teacher and say, what do I do? And he just said, you know, you've got to like take care of it because you're taking care of the house, right? And I felt terrible. I mean, obviously I didn't go out and just like squish them on purpose, but I was spraying the carpet where I know there's the, you know, I actually saw a few times caterpillars. I, it got quite bad. There were like mm. things flying everywhere. And at first I didn't even think there were moths. I just thought they were my friends. I was quite happy <laughs> to have friends in the house. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of had this relationship where they knew me and I knew them and they didn't get in the way of the shower and you know I didn't get in their way 
And then suddenly I'm having to kill all their little babies because I, I actually saw them crawling as well. At Caterpillars yeah. And the holes on the carpet are really big. It's really a mess, basically. So yeah, he said I had to do that and put the stuff down. And yeah, I felt really bad. I actually felt really bad. I remember yeah. a couple of times actually tearing up over it. Um, and I sort of said, you know, is it terrible karma? I've never killed anything and, you know, I feel like I've broken their trust and stuff like that. And he sort of just said, yeah. well, you still haven't forgiven yourself. You know, I forgave you a long time ago. You can have my extra helpings of forgiveness to <laughs> kind of take away that bad comment. And he's, I said, you know, I don't want to become like hard in my mind because of doing that. Yeah. And he said, he said, you're not, otherwise you wouldn't be sort of so remorseful. <laughs> it yeah. shows you're very soft. So I think, yeah, the fact that you feel bad and you feel for them so deeply shows that you actually yeah. do genuinely care and like, you know. Yeah. Basically, you're coming from a very kind and, and gentle motivation. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, your motivation is that you want to avoid harming. Yes. And sometimes, yeah, the, the other part is just life. We really want to avoid harming. We do everything we can to avoid harming, but we still live in this world, you know. Yeah. And I think I think we just have to accept that. And then, yeah, like the teaching that Ajahn gave me, it's like I can I can go over and over it in my mind and be really hard on myself, which creates even more bad karma. Or I can just say, OK, this happened. I put the causes in place so it doesn't happen again. I'll try not to let the moths build up back in yes. a lot or whatever. Um, and I'll forgive myself. Yeah, because that's making peace. That's making good karma in the here and now. So I hope that helps. Thank you. It really does. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Aya. <laughs> Sorry, we didn't notice you. When when um, Gustav said Dini at first, I thought he might have been referring to Diana. Oh, no, that's fine. In a different accent. <laughs> 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 then I realized there's two of you. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. OK. It's a big subject and it's great that we get like practical questions because really if we could understand karma we'd be sorted wouldn't we oh say that about everything if we only we understood something <laughs> right so the next thing so we've said what is the source and origin contact is its source and origin and yes there's different levels of causality so certainly we can make a lot of karma by reacting with with or without craving at the level of sensations as well, the level of contact, feeling, etc. And what is the diversity of karma? So this is the bit that's different from the usual formulation. There is karma to be experienced in hell, karma to be experienced in the animal realm, karma to be experienced in the realm of afflicted spirits. Sometimes it calls that hungry ghosts, but I think there's more than just hungry ghosts in there. Kama to be experienced in the human world and Kama to be experienced in the Deva world. This is called the diversity of Kama. So this starts to get at how we basically produce the realm I don't want to say that we deserve, but it's like if we create the sort of, I mean, the good news is that we've created human karma and that's why we're born as human beings. So we're obviously good enough to be human beings. <laughs> and the karma that we're creating most of the time, as long as we're being human beings, you know, and we're not acting like something else other than a human being, is most likely to result in more karma, in other words, more rebirth as a human being. But then there's certain types of karma to be experienced in hell. So certain things that we do are then to be experienced with a lot of suffering. But I think with all these things, I think here the Buddha is actually talking about different realms, but we can also experience a range or a diversity of karma even within the human life. If you think of the vast, vast difference between human beings, faculties, circumstances, capacity to understand the Dhamma or really not, you know, really follow a path of delusion, a path of hate. Um, people born into, you know, comfortable conditions, people born into abject poverty, 
you can't say that, you know, the people born into comfort had good karma and the others didn't, you know, again, it's really mixed, but there's obviously a huge diversity of, of different situations, of different experiences, even within the human realm. And um, one of the things that's interesting when we start to meditate and notice the way our mind behaves, you know, when we're just alone with our mind and you start to see how you feel about certain things you've done or said, or things that have happened in your life, Sometimes you feel like, wow, this is like living in the Deva realm. Lots of joy comes up and you think, oh, this must be like, this is like as happy as it can get. And then other times you think this, this is just so unbearable. You know, there's such a lot of desperation and despair. So in that sense, we can experience these realms now within our mind, right? And sometimes we don't know why they arise. Sometimes we don't know. Sometimes there's an obvious cause, but other times it might be hormonal, it might be chemical, it could be something that maybe isn't even traceable in this life. But again, you know, it's um, we can influence how that karma arises by the way that we relate to it as it arises right now. And that's really the way out. We're not stuck with these things. So come as not some kind of like fatalistic thing that, you know, you did this, now you get this punishment. That's not the way it works. It's in a constant kind of flow and we can constantly modify it in a way that leads to the wholesome states increasing. So, yeah. Is there any, shall I keep reading or are there any questions on that? Shall I keep going? And what is the result of Kama? The result of Kama, I say, is threefold. To be experienced in this very life or in the next rebirth or on some subsequent occasion. Which probably means in the next or the next or the next or the next rebirth. This is called the result of karma. So it isn't always an instant thing. And what community is the cessation of karma? With the cessation of contact, there is cessation of karma. Again, quite unusual that the Buddha would put it that way. But I don't think it's probably worth analysing it too much because he puts things in different ways throughout the suttas. And as I say, this is quite a rare uh, way for him to frame it. But certainly at the point where contact ceases, there's no comma being created at that point. But it doesn't mean that all comma has gone forever. Right. You still have like a, a storehouse because <laughs> you're still probably going to come back unless you actually go into like some stage of like cessation of Vedana and perception, which is like actually cessation. It's like a taste of Nibbana. At that point, you actually it's such a strong experience that you will actually wear away a lot of the karma that will say take you into lower realms or even, you know, karma that will um, produce any more craving and aversion at all. So these are really deep experiences. And they say that if you experience cessation of perception and feeling, then you're either an anagami or an arahat after that. So the last two stages of the path. So for an anagami, they have already overcome all craving and aversion, lost desire, anger and ill will. Yeah. So, so this noble eightfold path is the way leading to the cessation of karma, namely right view, etc., etc., all the way to right stillness. So again, isn't it wonderful that there's all these things we have to overcome, there's all these things that arise and need to be understood, but the way to understand all of them is the Eightfold Path. So it's not like we have to walk on the Eightfold Path first to understand Dukkha, then it's like, oh, I didn't understand like the cessation of karma, so I better start again and understand <laughs> the cessation of karma. No, it's more that all these uh, insights, all these understandings arise together once you see through suffering and you see the causes of suffering, that means you've understood karma as well, to a degree, uh, at least, yeah. 
I mean, you've understood it enough to know how to remove the causes of suffering. But the Buddha said that, you know, to understand karma in its depth is really difficult, even for a stream winner. Um, and only the Buddha could really understand it in full. So we don't need to get too much into the philosophy, but just to see, you know, again, how it arises, what kind of results it has, how it ceases, and the path leading to that cessation. So then to end this little reading, the Buddha says, when community, a noble disciple thus understands karma, the source and origin of karma, the diversity of karma, the result of karma, the cessation of karma, and the way leading to the cessation of karma, they understand this penetrative spiritual life to be the cessation of karma. Mm, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I liked that too. <laughs> Excellent. Wow. So if we live this spiritual life to its fullest, there'll be no more causes for any kind of rebirth to arise. And for people who see suffering, that can only be a good thing. For people who haven't yet seen it, that is actually a terrifying thing. And I can imagine that that's a wonderful thing because I've got enough sort of preliminary right view to think that's a really great thing. But, you know, there's something blocking me from getting all the way. So there's still some clinging. <laughs> so we think, great, when it's all gone, wonderful bliss. But actually, we're still not quite willing to let it go. So as I said, I did want to talk about how karma can be diluted, but I think that makes more sense if I read the next sutta first. Um, it's only short, but let's pause. What's the time? We're still good for time. So are there any questions or comments now at this point? Yep. Can we take John? John? Yeah. Hi, John. John. Hi, John. You need to unmute. Oh, sorry. Yes. Good evening. Uh, just can, could you give me some clarity, please? On I, hope I was so. a little bit um, um, confused in on, in the realms of afflicted spirits, and then also the day de the devil world. So I was just trying to sort of quantify which which was what and I couldn't ah, really okay. grasp that. Mm. Thank okay, you. yeah. Mm. So the afflicted spirits are like the lower realms. So they're below the animal realm. And okay. they include things like hungry ghosts, which are supposed mm. to have a really tiny mouth and a really, really massive stomach. So it's a bit like whatever they eat is like you're trying to suck it through a tiny straw and you've got this massive stomach. Um, okay. So that's the result of a lot of greed, I think, selfishness, greed, that kind of thing. And there's other afflicted spirits as well, like yakas, I think. Are, I think yakas are in there. I'm not quite sure. Yakas are a strange one. Sometimes they're not so bad. So I'm not quite sure. And I don't think it's absolutely fixed either. Um, because there are all kinds of really strange beings. Like my teacher in Burma, he could see strange beings like devas and all kinds of beings. And mm -hmm. some of them were really interesting how he described them. Anyway, I'm not sure I should really talk about those things, but it was really interesting. And for him, it was just normal, a normal part of life since he was like really young to just see these things. So it gave you a sense that there are all sorts of beings we're not aware of. Um, but yeah, Ajahn Brahm always says these lower, so-called lower beings, they're actually in a sort of deprived state and they're very full of fear, full of, you know, misery, merely. So they're not something to be afraid of, you know. They actually sometimes hang around because they want some metta. And also in Burma, my teacher used to say, wherever I go, if I'm in a like new place, new room, new little cell or something, always kind of ask permission from whoever's there um, uh, and say sort of like, I'm just coming here to practice for a while. I'm not meaning to push you out, it's your space. Um, and I'm just meditating and I'll share, you know, any benefits that I get from meditation with you. Uh, 
and to do that every time. And I think that was probably for the good beings, but maybe also any other types of beings that might create a disturbance. Yeah. And there was one time when he did say that um, there were beings creating disturbances because we'd moved into this monastery, which was like, basically he sort of built it from scratch, including the land, because the land was flat, but he was creating like ponds and hills and all sorts of things. So, and planting things, I mean, it completely transformed the land. Uh, and he said that some of the spirits there weren't quite happy yet. So they were trying to disturb us. And one morning, uh, my friend and I were, we used to get up quite early about 3.30 to meditate, but maybe it was about four that day. Anyway, she heard him cough a little bit outside our kuti and he would have thought we were fast asleep, but he was circling and chanting in sort of semi meta. She said mm. she heard him about three in the morning. I was like, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> really really nice yeah yeah it's quite magical <laughs> okay can I carry on Rob because I'm just aware that there's not a lot of time and I'll come back to you later if possible but yeah we'll see if anyone else has questions too so the next part is called beings fair according to their karma the Buddha is speaking to a Brahmin when Brahmin, my mind was thus stilled, I'm changing the word concentrated to stilled, purified, cleansed, unblemished, rid of defilement, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability. That basically means he's had deep jhanas, basically. After that, I directed it to the knowledge of the passing away and rebirth of beings. With the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, I saw beings passing away and being reborn, inferior and superior, beautiful and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. And I understood how beings fare in accordance with their karma thus. These beings who engaged in misconduct by body, speech, and mind, who reviled the noble ones, held wrong view and undertook action based on wrong view, with the breakup of the body after death have been reborn in the plane of misery, in a bad destination, in the lower world, in hell. But these beings who engaged in good conduct by body, speech, and mind, who did not revile the noble ones, who held right view, and undertook action based on right view, with the breakup of the body after death have been reborn in a good destination in the heavenly world. Thus, with the divine eye which is purified and surpasses the human, I saw beings passing away and being reborn, inferior and superior, beautiful and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. And I understood how beings fare in accordance with their karma. This was the second clear knowledge attained by me in the middle watch of the night. I'm changing the word ignorance to delusion because I'm pretty sure it's avidya. Delusion was dispelled. Clear knowledge had arisen. Darkness was dispelled. Light had arisen. As happens when one dwells heedful, ardent and resolute. This Brahmin was my second breaking out like that of a chick breaking out of the eggshell. So he stopped there with the second one because these are the ones that relate to Kama. So these are the ones, you can do your homework and tell me what the third one is next week. <laughs> and go to number eight. It's also in the Majima, I'm pretty sure. Isn't that in the Samana um, Pala? No, Samanya Pala. Arya Pariyasana Sutta? I imagine possibly. Mm, about the Buddha's journey to enlightenment. So imagine that if you could actually see very clearly the effects of people's body, speech, and mind on their next destination. I guess it would give a certain rationale or certain feeling of things being in their sort of proper order somehow. And also be quite frightening, right? Quite frightening in a way. 
So in case you were afraid, I had got another sutta to read to you. <laughs> Anyone afraid? I don't think anyone needs to be afraid here. As I said, remember, these are all kind of, you know, I mean, it's common in the suttas also to look at things in terms of the good and the bad, the right and the wrong, the black and the white. But these things are never actually black and white in such a way. So when it's saying, for example, those beings who had right view and undertook action based on right view, it doesn't mean that if you're not a stream winner, you're going to hell. You know, you could, you could depending on what you've done, but it's unlikely because remember there's a preliminary right view that at least has an appreciation that there is such a thing as karma. You know, there are, there are results of our actions, body and speech, and there are um, aesthetics and Brahmins, there are noble beings, and we can make good karma by offering to these beings, right? There is mother and father, we can have gratitude, we can take care of them, we can, you know, develop beautiful qualities and relate by relating to the people who've helped us so much in our lives. So these kind of right views are more than enough to undertake action based on right view as well. But just to be aware that, you know, we will have a certain amount of um, unskillful karma. We will have a certain amount of things that manifest in our lives, maybe as anger or even hate from time to time or feelings like we're just drowning in suffering. But, you know, in the long run of your life, are the wholesome qualities generally increasing? This is kind of what you want to be aiming for. Uh, and regarding the difficult emotions, the difficult things that do arise as the results of karma, that you have the ability right now to make good karma by just allowing them to be. Don't fight them. Don't, you know, develop hatred towards the hatred or anger towards the anger. <laughs> <laughs> or judgment was the judgment, the inner tyrant. So I wanted to read this other lovely sutta because it also talks about how the kama manifests in different ways according to the state of our mind in the present. So this is called the lump of salt and it's <laughs> You'll have to have loads of text, won't you soon? It's called the Anguttara Nikaya. And it's big. That's why I thought we'll start with a small book in these sort of classes. So it's big and it's um, Book of the Three is number 100. You can check it out online later if you wish. A lump of salt. It's so heavy, I can't even put it on my computer without fear that I'll turn it off. Okay. So monastics, we'll call it monastics this time. Monastics, if one, if one was to say thus, a person experiences karma in precisely the same way that they created it, in such a case, there could be no living of the spiritual life and no opportunity would be seen for completely making an end of suffering. But if one were to say thus, when a person creates karma, that it is to be experienced in a particular way, Oh, sorry. When a person creates karma that is to be experienced in a particular way, they experience its result precisely in that way. In such a case, the living of the spiritual life is possible and an opportunity is seen for the complete, completely making an end of suffering. Okay, don't worry about that bit too much, even though I don't quite get that bit. The next bit's more important. So here, monastics, some person has created trifling bad karma, yet it leads them to hell, while some other person has created exactly the same trifling karma, yet it is to be experienced in this very life, without even a slight residue being seen, much less an abundant residue. What kind of person creates trifling bad karma that leads to hell? Here, some person is undeveloped in body, virtuous behavior, mind and wisdom. They are limited and have a mean character and they dwell in suffering. When such a person creates trifling bad karma, it leads them to hell, okay? So that means the person already is doing heaps and heaps of bad stuff. The general direction of their life is, is really um, going kind of downhill. And so, yeah, they're just digging themselves into a deeper and deeper hole. 
What kind of person creates exactly the same trifling bad karma, yet it is to be experienced in this very life without even a slight residue being seen, much less an abundant residue? Here, some person is developed in body, virtuous behavior, mind, and wisdom. They are unlimited and have a lofty character, and they dwell without measure. So that's a synonym for the immeasurable states, the Brahma Viharas. They dwell with metta, with karuna, mudita, and upekka. At least inclining in that way as much as they can. When such a person creates exactly the same trifling bad karma, it is to be experienced in this very life without even a slight residue being seen and much less an abundant residue. And then there's a very lovely simile. Suppose a person would drop a lump of salt into a small bowl of water. What would you think, monastics? Would that lump of salt make the small quantity of water in the bowl salty and undrinkable? Yes, venerable sir. For what reason? Because the water in the bowl is limited. Thus that lump of salt would make it salty and undrinkable. But suppose a person would drop a lump of salt into the river Ganges. What do you think, monastics? Would that lump of salt make the river Ganges become salty and undrinkable? No, venerable sir. For what reason? Because the river Ganges contains a large volume of water. Thus that lump of salt would not make it salty and undrinkable. So that's very encouraging, isn't it? Especially for people who had to kill their carpet moths or their fleas. It's very encouraging. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we've all done things like that. We had to kill hair knits and stuff. And, you know, even the Jains, they go around with like a brush. I've actually managed a retreat with the Jains in India. It was in somewhere in Gujarat. And uh, I was managing the retreat and the whole retreat was Jane monks and nuns and they'd walked for thousands of, well, I don't know how many miles, but they just walk. I mean, the whole life was like being on the move. So they had these sticks and then they had these, um, like the piece of fabric, but they had these uh, like brushes, really sweet, like very, very soft, not straw, but sort of um, almost like hair brushes. And before they sat on their meditation cushion, they'd, they'd look underneath and they'd brush underneath to get rid of any invisible beings and their idea is that you can't kill anything at all so they tried to get make sure they don't even kill invisible beings but even then you see I mean it's a lovely attitude but it's in a sense you can say I mean I don't want to criticize it as an extreme because I think it's great to do as little harm as possible but the problem with it is that you can't actually never kill anything <laughs> I mean, just by breathing, you're going to breathe in an insect or, you know, something's going to fly in your eye, right? So the idea is that we don't intentionally kill and take life, you know, and especially not through a motivation of hate. If it's not with a motivation of hate, it's very, 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 very different. Yeah. And also there is something that talks about um, the size of a being. I'm not sure where that is in the suttas. It might not be so specific as that. But generally speaking, the bigger and the more intelligent and um, yeah, a being, so like a human being or dolphin, elephant, what are the other really intelligent animals? Pigs. This is worse karma than killing, say, like an ant. Probably because they have a greater feelings. I'm not quite sure, a more complex emotional world. Perhaps they have more possibility to create good karma. I'm not really sure. But, um, but I think we can all know that there's a difference there. It might also be the force that's needed to kill a larger being. It makes a difference as well. So we are, I'd actually close my books. And maybe I should because I think it's time that you had something to say. So, shall we take questions from, let's prioritize people who haven't asked, but if we can, we'll come to everyone. Anupama, would uh, I will ask to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Perfect. Yes, <laughs> yes just uh, on, on the last point you mentioned about the beings, so more intelligent yeah. beings, um, you would, I suppose, accrue greater karma. 
what if the volition to kill an ant mm. is more than say to kill the intelligent being <laughs> mm, mm. yeah good point i mean if the volition to kill say a person is actually not there for example in the case of a doctor who simply can't save life then of course any volition to actually harm a being is is worse no matter what size so i think this is where it gets kind of subtle and i mean it's i took a risk in saying that really mm-hmm. and it's very general i mean i think you get the general idea right sure yes yes so, you know, um, to take a human life is generally worse. Whether it should be or not, I suppose that's quite disputable. Um, And obviously a lot of animal rights activists would say there's no difference, who are we to say, you know? Um, But I would see it more in terms of the harm that's inflicted, I suppose. And the amount of anger and ill will that you have Mm. in your heart, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, you see people, don't you? I've seen people actually in India or other places where they're really scared of things that there's no need to be scared of, like geckos. And they just kind of attack them, you know, or you see kids on a train and they just squash a cockroach. Sure. I just, yes. I just saw a question yes. about a cockroach. I just want to, I just seen a question and I mentioned cockroach. I don't want to freak you out. You saw a friend kill a cockroach. Yeah, or you killed a cockroach. Oh, you asked a friend to kill a cockroach. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. Next time, just try and find preventative measures for killing the cockroach. Yeah. Sorry, Anupama, was there more to that? Or was that? A moment. Okay. I have to ask her to unmute again to answer. <laughs> she might. <laughs> Sorry, yes, I, I muted myself. Um, yes, I mean, for me, I think I've always grown up hearing, I think this is probably what from my mother, she always said it's it's your intention that mm. comes uh, good, first. Good. So that's yes. what, um, yeah, so that's kind of stuck with me. Yes, uh, but yes. I, I can understand you know how how the other things also come into play and um Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah i I, I mean i i know people who i've I've known personally people who just hit uh get cause in sex they get really (laughs) annoyed uh and you know they get uh, pest control to Mm -hmm. get rid of them Mm -hmm. so the days Mm -hmm. are like um intent the, 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 there is a dislike or hatred yeah or, yeah yeah or, exactly or will towards the, these little animals and mm-hmm. anyway <laughs> so yeah just yeah. compared with all that <laughs> yeah yeah really really important because these are the practical things aren't they in our lives mm. you know? these mm. are the things we have to um we have to consider really carefully and i think your mom's really right in saying that, and it's a really wise teaching that you you grew up with there, and mm-hmm. um, and the because the implications for that also give you a very good motivation for practicing. They give you a very good motivation for taking up the practice of meditation in particular, because that's when we can really have a good look at where we're really coming from. Because sure. sometimes we might think we don't have anger, we don't have ill will. It's just, you know, it just slipped out or, you know, <laughs> or I just yeah. kind of, it was a reflex. But when we start <laughs> to see our mind and we start to develop mindfulness, you know, um, and become a lot more honest with ourselves in a way, we see where those unwholesome tendencies arise from and we catch them at that level of contact of feeling. And in that sense, again, I think, as Diana said, it's really helpful to work at that level of, of feeling in the body because often when anger or irritation arises, we can actually realize that we're reacting to a certain sensation in our body. And if we can stay at that level of contact before it turns into a reaction, um, it's like we change our attitude towards that feeling Mm. and allow that to fade. And with it, the anger, the emotional kind of energy tied up around that also starts to fade. And then we can actually... Um, deal with situations you know outside in a much more skillful way so I think you know the practice of meditation is a great way to start purifying that volition because as I say you know the volition is never like a hundred percent pure impure 
Sure, sure. So yes, that does make sense. And uh, I think it's very applicable <laughs> mm. to our lives. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Mm. Good. Yeah. Are there any more comments? Well, shall I go to this cockroach one? Because it continued more quickly. So they say that usually I catch them and send them in the garden, but not that time. So don't count the times that you didn't do it. Count the times that you did. So that's your balance, isn't it? <laughs> Good or bad comment. So, yeah. So remember the simile of the salt. Don't beat yourself up for the good one. Imagine if you could celebrate just as much for every cockroach that you saved, as much as you beat yourself up for the one that you killed. Imagine that. You'd be celebrating so much. You wouldn't have time to repent. <laughs> It'd be great. But we forget to rejoice in the wholesome karma that we make. And that's another point, actually, because the Buddha said that, um, you know, not only to perform virtuous action, but then to reflect and recollect it as well. Chaganu sati. And thinking about that in the context of karma puts a whole deeper meaning on it. It's not only to get joy coming up so that you can then have a nice meditation. It's also to kind of encourage your mind and, and bring up the good karma, the good result of doing good. Yeah. Sometimes people don't want to do it because they think it's egotistical to think about the kind things I've done. But that's missing the point. It's not about you. It's to look at how it feels. Look at the karmic effects of how it feels to be kind, you know, or how it feels to be generous. And, and then you're actually experiencing those effects. And like in that simile the salt that I read, the lump of salt sutta, um, if you can actually enter into like, oh, just practice, I mean, it doesn't matter how deep you go, practice states of loving kindness and compassion, then the mind becomes expansive, it becomes really wide. And I had this beautiful experience with some trauma that had been there in my mind for a couple of years, probably, or a year. Um, and whenever I would think about this person or what had happened, I'd get this <gasps> in my stomach, you know, really terrible and a lot of trauma around it, a physical trauma of being attacked, actually. And then one day, because I decided I won't send that to that person, because as long as I'm still being triggered, it's not really helpful. It's better to look after myself and you know be ready for that. And then one day I was practicing metta in, actually it was about a 10 day retreat and I made metta my main object and I was practicing to my best friend it was flowing really nicely and that person came to mind and it was just like whoo, just evaporated like it was almost like it didn't just not impact me the person actually just seemed to flow into the meta stream they just seemed to be like taken into the meta and I think of it like that similarly assault the mind was wide enough that it didn't impact me so there was no residue there of hate. And the interesting thing is that after that, I could talk about it, I could reflect on it, it without the emotional charge. So it really did feel that something, something sort of changed. And it actually says in another sutta that in those states, sometimes no limiting comma remains. Oh, I thought I'd put the bookmark in the right place. But anyway, maybe that's enough content. Have I found it? Yeah. So it says when one dwells pervading one quarter or all the directions, for example, with loving kindness. Uh, yeah, one dwells pervading all the directions with loving kindness. When the liberation of mind by loving kindness is developed in this way, no limiting action remains there, none persists there. It's very nice, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, it's a, it's a deep subject. It could be seen as quite an intellectual subject, but I hope that we can take some joy from this subject in realizing that we can uh, be the architects of our life to a certain extent, whatever we have to work with, right? Because there's not much we can do about what we have to work with, <laughs> but we can work with it. <laughs>
And we all have a human birth, which is a very fortunate birth. In the diversity of karma, I was actually surprised that the Buddha didn't say there was karma to ripen in the lower realm and then he went to the higher realm. But I guess he's giving the whole spectrum because the human realm is also a higher realm in the sense that we get a sort of a good amount of suffering as well as happiness, enough to be able to understand the nature of both. And so it is considered probably the most promising realm in which we can make steps on the path. And of course, imagine, I mean, we have so many Dhamma teachings on Zoom. I don't think the Devas, well, they might be watching Zoom talks. I don't know. But <laughs> maybe they're actually in everybody's room and there's absolutely masses of them. Who knows? But um, there's certain advantages we have, actually, in this human realm, I feel. So, and all of us here are certainly safe enough, well-fed enough, comfortable enough in our lives to be able to come and listen to the Dhamma and you know how and not only that but have chosen to do that because you could have chosen to do anything else this evening there's a massive diversity of choice right there's a diversity of comma so your your comma this evening has ripened in a dharma session on zoom very good <laughs> i thought i had no energy but i always have energy when i get in into these rooms uh, is there any last comment that anybody would like to make? We've got two minutes, so it'll be a quickish comment. Um, is there anything? Was your comment fairly brief, Rob, or is it a question you'd like to say for another time or been answered already? No? All good. All right. Oh, yes, right. I'm supposed to invite Gunther now to say a few words. If you could give us another minute or two, that would be wonderful because my co-hosties are getting excellent in, in doing this. It's okay. Kelly today. It's, it's Kelly. Yes. Yay. Hi, Kelly. Good evening, everyone. I just would like to say a few words about the practice of dana. Uh, dana meaning generosity in Pali and uh, something the Buddha identified as an important practice on the path. Um, it can help us let go of self-interest, cultivate a joyful mind, loving kindness and compassion. Um, so your gift, whatever you are able to offer, would provide uh, for Venerable Chanda's material needs and help her to continue spreading the Dhamma um, as she is today and several other times during the week, as well as supporting the development of the first Bikuni Monastery in the UK. Um, you can find out more information about the project and how to donate on the website. And there is a link in the chat box as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sadu, sadu, sadu. Thank you, Kelly. So lovely. So very nicely done. <laughs> I was saying to my co-host team before we started, it was like being with some kind of BBC crew or something. So professional, you know, all that on the jobs. You've done the muting, you've got you're doing the recording. Like, wow, I felt really, really happy. So they are the bold, brilliant, and compassionate BBC. <laughs> Excellent. All right, enough of my lightness. <laughs> I just feel happy. I don't know, coming into these sessions, being able to talk about some of the deep stuff, it's really uh, it's really satisfying. And, and the fact that you're all still here, I don't think anybody's run away. Um, it's just great. It, it shows me that, you know, this little online community, which keeps changing and morphing, is, uh, yeah, pretty mature, I would say. So thank you. And I also learn a lot from everyone. So yeah, lovely to see you all. So now we normally unmute you so you can wave goodbye and say goodbye. And I get to hear people's voices if you wish. <laughs>